Uh, resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with the consent of the House, I'd like to share my time with the member from Randon Buren, St. George's. One of the most substantial efforts, Mr. Speaker, that we can make on behalf of our veterans is to help them find a career. Order. Just uh, remind the Honourable Member, if he wishes to split his time in the first round, it requires the unanimous consent of the House. So does the, does the Honourable Member have consent? He does. Agreed. The Honourable Member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of, the, one of the most substantial efforts, Mr. Speaker, that we can make on behalf of our veterans is to help them find a career when they're released, medically or voluntarily, from the Canadian Forces. This bill might do this, though even if it does, I'm afraid it likely won't be enough. This bill amends the Public Service Employment Act to increase access to hiring opportunities in the public service for certain serving and former members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Furthermore, and perhaps more notably, this legislation establishes a right of appointment in priority to all other persons for certain members of the Canadian Forces who are released for medical reasons which are attributable to service. If a member of the Canadian Armed Forces is released due to a service-related injury or illness, their priority in the public service hiring moves from fourth to first. Access to internal postings of the public service and priority over all others for external postings is extended to the Canadian Armed Forces members and veterans who served at least three years and were honorably released. It is one thing to have priority to jobs in the public service, but it remains contingent on possessing the skills that match any number of the public service jobs that exists, and it relies on there being positions available in the first place. There is nothing in this bill that offers any form of skills translation or upgrading. Also, with a freeze on hiring, what jobs are Conservatives proposing these veterans will fill? 50,000 fewer jobs and a freeze on new hiring means that not many jobs are really available to recently or medically released veterans. Officials from Veterans Affairs Canada noted that where issues arise, they involve certain groups of veterans, younger veterans, those with fewer years of service, those in the lower ranks, and those medically or involuntarily released. The unemployment rate for veterans is more or less the same as the general Canadian unemployment rate, about 8%. That said, the unemployment rate for medically released veterans is much higher at approximately 15%. Beyond potential incapacity, there is the additional hurdle of seriously injured veterans who may be unlikely to find employment in line with their initial goals. Injury dashes a lot of those dreams. It is a long and often endless road from recovery to rehabilitation and finally to employment. This bill neither shortens this road nor hastens the completion of your effort. This government cannot look a wounded soldier in the eye, point to this bill as an example of what a good job they're doing if, when that man or woman is ready to re-enter the workplace, they are then told there's no vacancy, a hiring freeze is in place, and that their time in the Canadian Forces really didn't prepare them for a career in the public service. Realistically, this bill is an anathema to Conservatives. They don't believe that the government has any real role in Veterans Affairs, career transition, or rehab. First and foremost, Conservatives have cut hundreds of millions of dollars from Veterans Affairs Canada, a billion really, tying the hands of the department when it comes to delivering the benefits and supports that veterans rely on. Now add the egregious closure of nine regional Veterans Affairs offices, often in more remote places like Brandon, Manitoba and Sydney, Nova Scotia on Cape Breton, making it more difficult for veterans to access these benefits and services in their communities. It is unconscionable that veterans, some of them seniors, might have to drive hours outside of their communities to receive face-to-face -face help. Conservatives have claimed that veterans can still attend nearby Service Canada centres for services, but frontline staff at Service Canada are not trained to specifically help veterans. And caseworkers are currently burdened with a 40 to 1 caseload ratio. So the government would like Canadians to think they're doing a great job with veterans hiring. They spent millions of dollars advertising the career transition services in prime time playoff slots. I say millions because among the only new spending in this year's Veterans Affairs estimates is $4 million for advertising, a new and exclusive line item. 
I say millions because despite my requests of both the minister, his political staff and his departmental officials, I can't get an answer as to how much money they are spending on their advertising precisely. Had the minister accepted the committee's invitation to in testify in this bill, I might have asked him how many veterans currently have access to priority hiring and how many more will have access with the changes made and how many positions are in fact available to these veterans. I might have also asked him about concerns expressed by the Veterans Ombudsman, Guy Perron, who early on questioned the adjudication of a releasing Canadian Armed Force members file to determine if the medical release is service related or not. This will be important in determining whether the member has a statutory or regulatory priority or in effect whether the priority will be for internal or external postings. This was unclear in the legislation and I fear has become a little more complicated since amendments proposed by the government at the committee. Initially the legislation held that the priority for appointment over all others was given to, and I'm quoting, a person who was released from the Canadian forces for medical reasons that are attributable to service, who belongs to a class determined by the Commission and who meets the requirements established by the Commission. Upon amendment, the section I quoted changes the priority to be given to a person who was released from the Canadian forces for medical reasons that the Minister of Veterans Affairs determines are attributable to service. We know who adjudicates the files now, but I can't believe that leaving the discretion of the Minister was the sort of clarity the Ombudsman was looking for. Remember that this is a government which continually insists that it will not release soldiers before they're ready, but has repeatedly and abruptly ended the career of injured soldiers who have asked to be kept on. Finally, I would have asked him why his legislation imposes a five-year limit for priority hiring. For starters, the government isn't hiring right now. Anyone who applies once this bill goes into effect is racing against the clock for this government to lift its hiring freeze. More importantly, the government is putting five, a five-year time limit on rehabilitation and then on finding a job, now to count, not accounting for potential relapses of injuries at a later date or from a later manifestation of an injury that may not be present immediately upon release. I'm reliably informed that he or she, I'm reliably informed that he or she, uh, many still have an avenue to benefits, but no opportunity for employment. I think it important that they be eligible to be employed, notwithstanding that they have access to the other regulatory benefits at a time surpassing the five-year limit. We are always responsible for those who were so willing to make sacrifices on our behalf. Yet somehow this government feels that it has a limited responsibility for these brave men and women's unlimited liability. The minister would have you believe that veterans, if healthy, will just move on to a career in security or policing, but that's not true. There are veterans like Sergeant Yarn Nielsen who wants to be a financial planner or a lawyer like Corporal Mark Fushko. They don't need a government who dangles weak and ineffective legislation before, before them in place of real effective action. We've all just returned from Remembrance Day in our ridings a few weeks back, thousands of celebrations across the country, celebrations made perhaps more meaningful by the sacrifice of two brave members of the Canadian Armed Forces here in Canada at times they never would have expected to face threats or, or danger. We've all just returned from looking into the faces of generations of Canadians who serve this country with honour, dignity and professionalism. Our veterans, to our veterans we owe a sacred obligation. When they and their families agreed to make sacrifices for the well-being of Canada and Canadians, we committed to their well-being, their families and, in that commit and their families, and in that commitment lies the necessity to take care of them no matter what. I hope this bill creates positions for veterans. I, I truly do. And because even if it helps one veteran, it is something that we should and must support, and we will support it. But don't be mistaken. This is a weak, inefficient, and disappointing bill put forward by a minister and a government who has confirmed time after time after time that they would rather look good than do anything meaningful to help our service men and women and their families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.